Welcome back to our study of GPS. I hope you are enjoying it. Uh, we're right in the middle of things. Uh, we're we're going to uh, talk about one of the most beautiful and important parts of GPS today, which are the coordinate frames. And I'm going to try and put that into a little bit of context for you by talking about all the coordinate frames and then move on to the details of the Earth-centered inertial frame and the Earth-centered Earth-fixed frame. And that will set up our discussions in 3.3 and 3.4, where we actually talk about the transformations between the frames, because that's the key mathematical operation on the GPS nav message. And then in 3.4, talk about some additional details associated with the, uh, the navigation message. So here we go. Here's a good list of all the coordinate frames that are kind of immediately important to someone uh, studying the solar system or astronomy. Heliocentric means just that, uh, centered on the sun. So the origin of that frame is in the mass center of the sun. That will not be particularly important to GPS. We'll be much, much more concerned with a variety of geocentric frames. Earth-centered inertial means that that's a frame which has its origin at the mass center of the Earth uh, but does not rotate with the Earth. So it's fixed with rel uh, relative to the distant stars. And uh, in that way, it's uh, uh, inertial enough in terms of uh, our mathematics for GPS. Parafocal is also an inertial frame. Uh, it does not rotate relative to ECI, but it's pitched up to be uh, oriented with the orbital frame. So uh, it's important for that reason. Earth-centered, Earth-fixed, that, of course, is the frame that we all live in. We rotate with the Earth, as do most of the users of GPS. And therefore, the fundamental operation of uh, the uh, transformations of frames for GPS is to go from Keplerian parameters to parafocal to Earth-centered Earth inertial to Earth-centered Earth-fixed. And that way, we finally pin down the satellite locations in the same frame that our users operate in. One of the subtleties associated with that will be sidereal time, so we'll talk about that, and also the right ascension of the ascending node, which is uh, the point in inertial space where the satellite punches through the equatorial plane on its way upward uh, and uh, in its orbit around the Earth. And then the longitude of the ascending node, same point, but measured in an Earth-centered, Earth-fixed frame rather than Earth-centered inertial. Finally, there's a frame that uh, the user operates in, and that's so-called topocentric, and it finds uh, the horizon as being important, and then straight up from the Earth center through the user is the second axis, and then the third axis will complete a right-handed system. So that might be SES or NED. SES stands for South East Up, and uh, NED stands for North East Down. So in the one case, you have south and then up, because that gives you a right-handed system. And the other one, you have north and down, because that also gives you a right-handed system. Here are these uh, coordinate frame uh, transformations that I mentioned. And uh, as we uh, uh, said a couple of minutes ago, uh, the GNSS orbit calculations are transformations from one frame to another. Importantly, we get Keplerian parameters. We use those to define the satellite location in the parafocal coordinate system, uh, and then we transform them into Earth-centered inertial, and then finally into Earth-centered Earth-fixed. That's the heavy lifting associated with the opening and the interpretation of what comes in the GPS navigation message. Here is the heliocentric frame, <coughs> sun in yellow there in the center, and um, you see the Earth orbiting around the sun, and uh, perihelion, the place of closest passage to the sun, occurs out here at December 22nd. Aphelion, that point at which the Earth is farthest away from the sun at uh, July 1st. And the thing that I'd really like you to pay attention to here is that this is the uh, plane of the ecliptic.
And that is the plane in which the Earth orbits. So relative to the sun, that's the orbital frame of the Earth. It should not be confused with the equatorial plane, which is canted relative to that. So the equatorial plane is, of course, perpendicular to the pole of rotation that we see there. So this uh, slanted line that we see here in all four seasons is the pole about which the Earth rotates. And of course, the equatorial plane is perpendicular to that. <clears throat> and the equatorial plane and the plane of the ecliptic make an angle of 23 degrees. Pay close attention to how that rotational pole moves or relates to the sun. Out here at the winter solstice, which is when the northern hemisphere is pitched away from the sun, and therefore it's cooler, <coughs> um, that's so-called winter solstice for the northern hemisphere. It's the summer solstice for the southern hemisphere. But let's just think northern hemisphere for the time being. <coughs> at that time, the equatorial plane is pitched up and really never intersects the sun at all. It just goes out above it. Similarly, at the summer solstice, the equatorial plane is pitched down by the same 23 degrees. It do doesn't touch the sun at summer either. However, at the vernal equinox, springtime in the northern hemisphere, and the autumn equinox, fall time in the northern hemisphere, that rotational pole goes into a special orientation relative to the sun, it is neither pitched up nor pitched down relative to the sun. It certainly is pitched to the side, but not away or towards. And that means that if we were to draw the equatorial plane at that time, it would still be pitched up relative to the sun, but there would be an intersection between the equatorial plane, which I'll try and add here, looking something like that, and that intersection runs straight into the center of the sun and straight out through the autumn equinox. This is a very, very important line. It's called the vernal equinox. So we use that phrase, that label, for two purposes. One to talk about where the Earth is and the time of year when it's out here at this significant location, but also the line that results when we draw that line segment from the center of the Earth at the vernal equinox through the sun out this way. Turns out that's the reference frame for the Earth-centered inertial. So even as the Earth moves around the sun, that line does not rotate with the Earth. It's always going to be pointing out in this direction, regardless of the Earth location. And so that, together with the pole of rotation, are the two defining axes for Earth-centered inertial. Um, people have pointed out that this vernal equinox does point to a more or less constant location relative to the distant stars. In fact, it used to point to the constellation Aries. And Aries is otherwise known as the ram, and so sometimes the symbol of the ram's horn is used to denote, denote this very, very important uh, axis. Here are those uh, notes just uh, put uh, here plainly for you. Um, and we've mentioned all three of these definitions of the vernal equinox. I will label it again here just to get you used to this symbol, which you'll see in uh, many of the texts on uh, astrodynamics. There are the three definitions of the vernal equinox. And so please study this. It's important, uh, it's important that you have a feeling for this vector that really nails down Earth-centered inertial and does not rotate with the Earth. Here's an exploded view. Now we're not looking at the sun anymore. We're just looking at the Earth. <clears throat> and I've rotated things a little bit. Now the vernal equinox is pointing over in this direction. So I'll let it uh, in the drawing rotate a little bit. 
we still talk about the pole of rotation, ZI, going up in that direction. And we complete the right-handed frame with YI. So remember, the right-handed frame is when you put your fingers through X, rotate them into Y, and then your thumb points up and identifies the direction of the third final axis. That would be ZI. So um, YI lies uh, in the equatorial plane because it's at right angles to the plane of rotation. So we show here the plane of ecliptic canted by 23 and a half degrees relative to the geostationary plane. So hopefully that gives you a feeling for the coordinate frames that are important to GPS. <clears throat> when we come back next time, we'll talk about the important mathematical transformations between information that may be provided in one of those frames, but which we have to uh, treat and process in another one of the frames. Until then, good luck.